which situations would require the nurse to obtain a prescription for physical restraints. Select all that apply. Bell restraint used for a confused client who keeps trying to get out of bed but is on bed rest. Elbow restraints used temporarily for a toddler while drawing blood. Full padded side rails in the raised position for a client during a seizure. Long leg immobilizer used for a client with a fractured tibia. Soft ankle restraint to prevent bleeding at the femoral site following cardiac catheterization. Which situations would require the nurse to obtain a prescription for physical restraints? Select all that apply. A physical restraint is a device or method used to immobilize or limit physical mobility or body movement to prevent false injury to self or others or removal of medical devices. The client situation, rather than the device, determines whether it is classified as a restraint. Prescribed orthopedic immobilizers and protective devices used temporarily during routine procedures or examinations are not considered physical restraints and do not require authorization for use from a healthcare provider. Restraints should be used only after less invasive methods have failed and must be discontinued at the earliest time possible once it is safe to do so. The belt restraint is applied at the waist and tied to the bed frame under the mattress with straps using a quick release knot. It is used to protect a confused or disoriented client who is on bed rest. Although the client can turn, it is considered a restraint because it restricts physical mobility and confines the client to the bed involuntarily. Option 1. Soft limb restraints e.g., wrist, ankle, immobilize one or more extremities and are used for the prevention of falls or attempted removal of devices. Following a procedure requiring sedation, clients may require restraints to protect them from disrupting a surgical site or medical device until they are alert enough to follow instructions independently. Option 5. Limb restraints should be applied loosely enough that two fingers can be inserted underneath the secured restraint. The nurse should closely monitor the peripheral neurovascular status and skin integrity of a client's restrained extremity. Option 2. Elbow restraints used as a protective device to temporarily immobilize a child less than 30 minutes to perform a medical diagnostic, e.g., drawing blood, or surgical procedure are not considered a physical restraint. Option 3. The use of full padded side rails in the raised position for clients during a seizure protects them from immediate injury. These are not considered a restraint. Option 4. An orthopedic leg immobilizer used to restrict movement and maintain a client's extremity in proper alignment is prescribed for therapeutic purposes and is not considered a restraint. Educational objective common physical restraint devices include limb, e.g., ankle, wrist, and belt restraints. The client situation, rather than the device, determines whether it is classified as a restraint. Exhibit. A six-month-old infant is brought to the emergency department after experiencing vomiting and diarrhea for four days. Which prescription from the healthcare provider is the priority? Click on the Exhibit button for additional information. IV acetaminophen 60 mg every 6 hours. IV ampicillin 240 mg every 12 hours. IV normal saline bolus 20 ml per kilogram over 1 hour. IV on Dancitron 2 mg every 8 hours. Exhibit. A 6-month-old infant is brought to the emergency department after experiencing vomiting and diarrhea for 4 days. Which prescription from the healthcare provider is the priority? Click on the Exhibit button for additional information. IV acetaminophen 60 mg every 6 hours. IV ampicillin 240 mg every 12 hours. IV normal saline bolus 20 ml per kilogram over 1 hour. IV on Dancitron 2 mg every 8 hours.
infants and young children have a higher percentage of body water than older children and adults. As a result, they become dehydrated quickly due to fluid losses caused by vomiting and diarrhea. Signs of severe dehydration include lethargy, sunken fontanelle, increased capillary refill time, increased heart rate, and increased respiratory rate. When dehydration is severe enough to affect the client's hemodynamic status or to potentiate shock, the priority is intravenous rehydration. Option 3. Option 1. A temperature of 100.4 F38C is a mild fever in an infant and may indicate the need for acetaminophen. However, hydration of the infant takes priority over this action. Option 2. Antibiotics may be indicated due to the infant's increased temperature. The fluid bolus is of higher priority, as restoration of circulating volume is key in severe dehydration. Option 4. Undansetron may be given to reduce nausea and vomiting after the infant is rehydrated intravenously, allowing for continued oral fluid replacement. Educational objective, severe dehydration occurs more rapidly in infants and young children due to a higher percentage of body water. Signs of severe dehydration include increased capillary refill time, increased heart rate, and increased respiratory rate. When severe dehydration occurs in an infant, the priority is intravenous rehydration. The nurse admits a client who fell off a 20 featuring 6M ladder. On arrival in the emergency department, the client is arousable but lethargic. What is the nurse's priority action? Ask about client's chronic medical conditions. Assess for level and duration of pain. Obtain a Glasgow Coma Scale Score. Perform a head-to-toe assessment. The nurse admits a client who fell off a 20 featuring 6M ladder. On arrival in the emergency department, the client is arousable but lethargic. What is the nurse's priority action? After trauma to a client, e.g. fall, the nurse performs an emergency or trauma assessment that includes a primary and secondary survey assessment. The primary assessment determines the status of the airway, breathing, and circulation ABCs. Next, the nurse evaluates disability D, of neurological function using the Glasgow Coma Scale GCS. The GCS measures the client's level of consciousness by assessing the best eye-opening response, best verbal response, and best motor response. The lower the GCS score, the higher the risk for the client to develop complications, e.g., loss of airway patency, increased intracranial pressure. Options 1, 2, and 4. Although a health history, head-to-toe assessment and notation of the client's level of pain are essential for the overall assessment, they are considered part of the secondary survey. This survey's purpose is to get a complete picture of the injuries but only after the client's priority needs have been addressed. Educational objective, after trauma to a client, e.g. fall, the nurse performs a primary survey to determine status of airway, breathing, circulation, disability, e.g. Glasgow Coma Scale to assess neurological impairment and exposure. Health history, head-to-toe assessment and level of pain are part of the secondary survey. An elderly client has a 17M duration after a tuberculin skin test TST. Based on this result, which statement is most accurate? The client has a false positive reaction due to advanced age. The client has a tuberculosis TB infection. The client has active TB disease. The client must be isolated immediately. An elderly client has a 17M duration after a tuberculin skin test TST. Based on this result, which statement is most accurate? Latent TB infection and active TB disease. Latent TB infection. Active pulmonary TB disease. Clinical manifestations. Asymptomatic. 1. Cough. 2. Constitutional symptoms. 1. Fever, chills, malaise. 
2. Weight loss, night sweats. 3. Anorexia, fatigue. TB transmission. No. Yes. Diagnostic tests. 1. Positive tuberculin skin test and interferon Y release assay. 2. Normal chest x-ray. 3. Negative sputum smear culture. 1. Positive tuberculin skin test and interferon Y release assay. 2. Abnormal chest x-ray. 3. Positive sputum smear culture. TB equals tuberculosis. In a heathy client, an induration greater than 15 mm indicates a positive TST. This means that the client was exposed to TB, developed antibodies to the disease, and has a TB infection. Additional tests are needed to determine if the client has latent TB infection, LTBI, or active TB disease. Clients with LTBI are asymptomatic and cannot transmit the microorganism to others. Clients with active TB disease usually are symptomatic and can transmit the microorganisms through the air. Option 1. The elderly have decreased immunity and may be unable to develop antibodies to react to the tuberculin. This can result in a false negative TST reaction. Option 3. A positive reaction to TST means that the client is infected with TB bacteria. The infectious bacteria are concealed by the body's defense and do not lead to active TB disease in most individuals. When the client has a decreased immunity, e.g., immunosuppression, bacteria cause an active TB disease. Additional diagnostic tests, e.g., chest x-rays, bacteriologic sputum smear for acid fast bacilli and culture, are needed to determine if this client has active TB disease. Option 4. A positive reaction indicates a TB infection only. Further evaluation and bacteriologic testing is necessary. If active TB is suspected before testing is completed, airborne transmission precautions will then be initiated. Educational objective. A positive reaction to TST means that a client was exposed to TB, developed antibodies, and now has a TB infection. Additional testing is needed to determine if a client has LTBI or active TB disease. A client is started on lisinopril therapy, which assessment finding requires immediate action. Blood pressure 129 80 of a millimeter Hg. Heart rate 100 per minute. Serum creatinine 2.5 mg per deciliter 221 micromole per liter. Serum potassium 3.5 meq L 3.5 mmol L. A client is started on lisinopril therapy, which assessment finding requires immediate action. Blood pressure 129 80 of a millimeter Hg. 2%. Heart rate 100 per minute. 7%. Serum creatinine 2.5 mg per deciliter 221 micromole per liter. 85%. Serum potassium 3.5 MEQ L 3.5 mmol L. 4%. Correct. 85%. Answered correctly. 37 sex. Time spent. 2022. Version. 1. Explanation. The dosage of angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE inhibitors, e.g., lisinopril, enalapril, ramipril, should be adjusted for clients with renal impairment. A serum creatinine of 2.5 mg per deciliter 221 micromole per liter indicates renal impairment normal 0.6 to 1.3 mg per deciliter 53 minus 115 micromole per liter. The nurse should notify the healthcare provider so that the dosage can be decreased or held. Options 1, 2, and 4. The client's blood pressure, heart rate, and serum potassium, normal 3.5 to 5.0 MEQ, L, 3.5 to 5.0 MMOL, L, are within normal limits. They do not require immediate action. Hyperkalemia and hypotension are contraindications for giving ACE inhibitors. Educational objective, evaluation of kidney function is essential for clients taking medications that are excreted renally or can worsen renal injury.
These include ACE inhibitors, e.g., lisinopril, enalapril, aminoglycosides, e.g., gentamicin, and digoxin. Pharmacological and parenteral therapies. NCSBN client need. Copyright, copyright, you world. All rights reserved. A client is receiving IV potassium. The IV pump displays an occlusion alarm. The tubing is free of occlusions, and the IV flushes easily without symptoms of infiltration. Which action should the nurse take next? Discard potassium and document administration of a partial dose. Exchange the IV pump with a different one. Insert a new IV catheter in a different location. Remove the pump and administer medication by gravity drip. IV infusion pumps display an occlusion alarm when IV solution cannot be infused due to pressure in the line. Common causes of occlusion include clamped or kinked IV tubing, clotting in the IV catheter, and kinking in the IV catheter with extremity movement e.g., elbow, wrist. The nurse should assess the tubing and IV site and flush the IV catheter to check patency. In the absence of identifiable occlusion, an alarming IV pump should be exchanged for a different one. Option 2. Malfunctioning equipment may harm the client and should be removed from the care area. The malfunctioning equipment is labeled as out of service and is sent for maintenance. A self-employed auto mechanic is diagnosed with carbon monoxide poisoning. Admission vital signs are blood pressure 90 40 seconds of a millimeter Hg pulse 84 per minute, respirations 24 per minute, and oxygen saturation 94% on room air. What is the nurse's priority action? Administer 5 mg inhaled albuterol nebulizer treatment to decrease inflammatory bronchoconstriction. Administer 100% oxygen using a non-rebreather mask with flow rate of 15 L per minute. Administer methoprednisolone to decrease lung inflammation from toxic inhalant. Titrate oxygen to maintain pulse oximeter saturation of greater than 95%. He purpose of hemoglobin, HGB, is to pick up oxygen in the lungs and deliver it to the tissues. It must be able to pick up oxygen and release it in the right places. Carbon monoxide, CO, has a much stronger bond to HGB than oxygen does. Consequently, Colorado displaces oxygen from HGB causing hypoxia that is not reflected by a pulse oximeter reading. The nurse's primary action is to administer highly concentrated 100% oxygen using a non-rebreather mask at 15 L per minute in order to reverse this displacement of oxygen. Option 1. Albuterol is not a priority action as bronchoconstriction is not a consequence of CO poisoning. Option 3. Administration of corticosteroids is not a priority, primary action is direct inflammation of the lungs is not an underlying cause for hypoxemia and hypoxia associated with CO poisoning. Option 4. When all available HGB binding sites are occupied, oxyhemoglobin or carboxyhemoglobin, saturation, SAU2, is 100%. The conventional pulse oximeter cannot differentiate carboxyhemoglobin from oxyhemoglobin as both absorb the oximeter's red and infrared light wavelengths. Consequently, the pulse oximeter reading may be adequate, greater than 90%, but severe hypoxemia and hypoxia may be present. Alternate methods of CO saturation measurement, e.g., multiple wavelength CO pulse oximeter, spectrographic blood gas analysis, are recommended. Educational objective, the conventional pulse oximeter is not effective in identifying hypoxia and CO poisoning. Diagnosis requires co-oximetry of a blood gas sample. 
the priority action is to administer 100% oxygen using a non-rebreather mask to treat hypoxia and help eliminate CO. The clinic nurse cares for a four-year-old who has been diagnosed with a pinworm infection. Which client symptom supports this diagnosis? Anal itching that is worse at night. Intestinal bleeding with anemia. Poor appetite with weight loss. Red, scaly, blistered rings on skin. Pinworms, i.e., enterobiasis, are very common in childhood and easily transmitted when microscopic pinworm eggs, which can be found on contaminated food, drink, toys, and linens, are inhaled or swallowed. Once ingested, the eggs hatch in the intestines. During the night, the female pinworm lays thousands of microscopic eggs in the skin folds around the anus, resulting in anal itching and troubled sleep. When the infected person scratches, eggs are transferred from the fingers and fingernails to other surfaces. Pinworm infection is treated with antiparasitic medications, option 1. Option 2. Hookworms, e.g., Ancelostoma, are parasitic blood-sucking roundworms that are contracted from larvae in contaminated soil. They migrate and attach to the intestines, causing intestinal bleeding and anemia. Option 3. Poor appetite, inadequate absorption of nutrients, and weight loss are associated with tapeworm infection, e.g. Tinea solium. Tapeworm larvae are ingested with food contaminated with feces or undercooked meat from an infected animal. Option 4. Ringworm is a skin infection caused by a fungus. It leads to red, scaly, blistered rings on the skin or scalp that grow outward as infection spreads. The fungus is easily spread by sharing hair care instruments and hats or via towels, linens, clothing, and sports equipment. Educational Objective Pinworms are a very common worm infection transmitted when microscopic pinworm eggs are inhaled or swallowed and then travel to and hatch in the intestines. During the night, the female pinworm lays eggs in the skin folds around the anus, resulting in anal itching and disturbed sleep. A nurse is discharging a client who is receiving lithium for treatment of a bipolar disorder. It is most important for the nurse to provide which instruction to the client. Avoid a high-potassium diet. Exercise regularly and maintain a high-fiber diet. Maintain oral hygiene. Report excess of urination and increased thirst. Lithium is a mood stabilizer most often used to treat bipolar affective disorders. It has a narrow therapeutic index 0.6 to 1.2 MEQ, L, 0.6 to 1.2 MMOL, L. Risk factors for lithium toxicity include dehydration, decreased renal function in the elderly, diet low in sodium, and drug-drug interactions e.g., nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, and thiazide diuretics. Chronic toxicity can result in neurologic manifestations, ataxia, confusion or agitation, and neuromuscular excitability, tremor. Myoclonic jerks, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, polyuria and polydipsia, increased thirst. Option 4 clients should be educated about monitoring for these symptoms and obtaining serum lithium levels at regular intervals. A client with schizophrenia is hospitalized. After two weeks of treatment, the frequency of the client's hallucinations seems to be diminishing. When first hospitalized, the client refused to leave the room. 
Now the client spends time in the day room, sitting in a corner watching television, but does not initiate conversation or social interaction with other clients or staff. What is the most appropriate activity for the client? A board game with a staff member. Participation in a group song fest. Planning a unit picnic. Playing bingo with other clients. Clients with schizophrenia have difficulty initiating and maintaining social interactions with other people. The nurse can facilitate interpersonal functioning by providing one-on-one -on -one interaction in which the client can practice basic social skills in a non-threatening way. Once the client feels more comfortable, the nurse can encourage participation in activities that require some interaction with others. Impaired social interaction is one of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Others include the following. Inappropriate flat or bland affect, an apathy emotional ambivalence, disheveled appearance inability to establish and move toward goal accomplishment lack of energy pacing and rocking, odd posturing regressive behavior. Inability to experience pleasure seeming lack of interest in the world and people it is the negative symptoms of schizophrenia that affect a client's ability to establish personal relationships and manage day-to-day -day social interactions. The positive symptoms of schizophrenia, hallucinations, delusions, thought impairment, often improve with psychotropic medications. Negative symptoms tend to persist even with medication. Psychosocial and supportive treatment, including psychotherapy, education, behavioral training, cognitive therapy, and social skills therapy, may be beneficial in improving the quality of life for clients with schizophrenia. Exhibit. The nurse cares for a client receiving intermittent peritoneal dialysis who is prescribed strict intake and output monitoring with calculation of net fluid balance each shift. Calculate the total net fluid balance for the shift. Record the answer using a whole number. Click the Exhibit button for additional information. Answer ML. Peritoneum dialysate, i.e., dialysis fluid, is infused into the peritoneal cavity, retained for a prescribed dwell time, e.g. 20 minutes, and then drained as dialysate outflow. For clients on peritoneal dialysis, fluid balance should be tracked closely with daily weights and strict intake and output monitoring. Net fluid balance is calculated by subtracting total output from total intake. The following steps are used to calculate the net fluid balance. Calculate total intake. Oral intake 240 milliliters plus 120 milliliters plus 180 milliliters equals 540 ml. Oral intake 240 milliliters plus 120 milliliters plus 180 milliliters equals 150 milliliters plus 100 milliliters equals 250 ml parenteral intake. 150 milliliters plus 100 milliliters equals 250 milliliters other intake. 1500 ml other intake. 1 
540 ml oral plus 250 ml parenteral plus 1500 ml dialysate equals 229 ml total intake 540 ml oral plus 250 ml parenteral plus 50 Total output 1400 ml dialysate outflow total output 1400 ml dialysate outflow calculate the net fluid balance total intake minus total output equals net fluid balance total intake total output equals net fluid balance 2290 ml minus 1400 ml equals 890 ml 2290 ml for clients on peritoneal dialysis, fluid balance should be tracked closely with daily weights and strict intake and output monitoring. Net fluid balance is calculated by subtracting total output from total intake. The nurse prepares a community education program about health promotion strategies for postmenopausal women. Which of the following teaching points are appropriate to include? Select all that apply. Consider seeing a dietitian for help with healthy weight maintenance. Consult with a healthcare provider for cholesterol monitoring. Engage in a daily weight bearing exercise regimen. Prioritize consumption of green, leafy vegetables and dairy products. Seek support to cope with any emotional symptoms. NCLE exchanges of 2017 please note that select all that apply say to questions on NCLEX can now include any number of correct responses. Only one option or up to all options may be correct. U World questions now reflect this change. Visit NCSBN NCLEX FAQs for more information. Loss of ovarian function during menopause causes a decrease in estrogen production, leading to reduced osteoblast activity and cardioprotective effect. Therefore, postmenopausal clients are at increased risk for osteoporosis and coronary artery disease CAD. Other physiological changes after menopause may include weight gain, sleep disturbances, fat redistribution, and vaginal atrophy. Clients should utilize health promotion strategies to reduce the effects of decreased estrogen levels, including consuming optimal amounts of dietary calcium, green, leafy vegetables, dairy products, and engaging in weight-bearing exercise to promote bone health, options 3 and 4. Closely monitoring cholesterol levels, e.g., HDL, LDL, triglycerides, as increased LDL cholesterol increases risk for CAD, option 2. Considering seeking the assistance of a dietitian and maintaining a low-calorie diet rich in fruits and vegetables, as hormone changes may cause a predisposition to weight gain, option 1. Seeking support to cope with any emotional symptoms, e.g., depression, mood swings, sadness, difficulty concentrating, caused by changing hormone levels, option 5. Educational objective Postmenopausal women should consume plenty of calcium-rich foods, e.g., dairy products, green, leafy vegetables, engage in weight-bearing exercise, monitor cholesterol levels. 
considered dietary counseling to maintain a healthy weight, eat a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, and seek support for any emotional symptoms. The nurse is teaching self-care management to a client experiencing an outbreak of genital herpes, which statement by the client indicates a need for further teaching. I will be sure we use condoms during intercourse as long as I have lesions. I will not touch the lesions to prevent spreading the virus to other parts of my body. I will use a hair dryer on a cool setting to dry the lesions after taking a shower. I will use warm running water and mild soap without perfumes to wash the area. Herpes simplex virus type 2, HSV2, is usually associated with genital herpes. Lesions are painful and appear as multiple small, fascicular lesions. Management strategies focus on disease spread, including auto-inoculation, e.g. fingers, and pain relief, and include Avoid sexual activity when lesions are present as the virus spreads through contact with the lesion. Barrier contraception is not sufficient during an outbreak. Option 1. After the outbreak has resolved, condoms should be used in future sexual encounters as transmission is possible even in the absence of active lesions. Keep the area with lesions clean and dry. Avoid use of perfumed soaps and bubble baths. Maintain proper hand hygiene and avoid touching the lesions to prevent spreading. Use sitz baths and oatmeal baths to provide comfort and relief of itching and burning. Option 2. Vesicles contain numerous virus particles, leading to the possibility of self-inoculation. This can be prevented by avoidance of hand contact with lesions during an outbreak. Option 3. Use of a hairdryer on a cool setting is an effective means of drying the lesions and promoting client comfort. Option 4. Warm water provides symptomatic relief. Mild soap containing no perfumes reduces the risk of irritation to the area. Educational Objective Clients experiencing an outbreak of genital herpes should abstain from sexual activity when lesions are present and use condoms in future sexual encounters as transmission is possible even in the absence of active lesions. Physiological Adaptation Exhibit the nurse is performing an initial assessment on a client in hypertensive crisis. What is the nurse's priority assessment? Click on the exhibit button for additional information. Heart sounds. Level of consciousness. Lung sounds. Visual fields and acuity. Hypertensive crisis is a life-threatening medical emergency characterized by severely elevated blood pressure, systolic is greater than or equal to 180 mm Hg and or diastolic is greater than or equal to 120 mm Hg. The client may have symptoms of hypertensive encephalopathy, including severe headache, confusion, nausea, vomiting, and seizure. Hypertensive crisis poses a high risk for end organ damage, e.g., hemorrhagic stroke, kidney injury, tart failure, popliteal
the nurse should prioritize neurological assessment e.g. level of consciousness lock cranial nerves as decreased lock may indicate onset of hemorrhagic stroke which requires immediate surgical intervention option 2 Treatment for hypertensive crisis typically includes IV nitrates or antihypertensives, e.g., nitroprusside, labetalol, nicardipine, and continuous monitoring, e.g., blood pressure, telemetry, urine output, in a critical care setting. The medical surgical nurse cares for a group of clients. Which client situations would prompt the nurse to notify the healthcare provider during the middle of the night? Select all that apply. Client develops right-sided upper and lower extremity drift. Client found lying unconscious on the floor. Client has order for heparin with surgery planned for the morning. Client has serum sodium of 124 MEQ, L, 124 MMOL, L. Client refuses a prescribed routine pain medication. The nurse contacts the healthcare provider, HCP, for certain circumstances, regardless of the time of day. An emergent call is warranted if a client falls, deteriorates significantly or dies, has critical laboratory results, needs a prescription that requires clarification, leaves against medical advice or runs away, refuses key treatments in a relevant period. The HCP should be called after the initiation of hospital protocols, e.g., Stroke, code blue, and after a concerning assessment finding, e.g., significant change in vital signs, unilateral drift, change in level of consciousness. Signs of trauma after a fall, options 1 and 2. Administration of heparin is normally discontinued prior to surgery due to the increased risk of bleeding and should be clarified with the HCP, option 3. The unit educator is performing skill validations with unit staff. Which of the following actions by the staff nurses demonstrate a correct understanding of parenteral medication administration? Select all that apply. Inject subcutaneous insulin at a 90-degree angle into the lower abdomen of an obese client. Inserts the needle at a 30-degree angle to administer an intradermal injection. Massages the injection site after administering an intradermal medication. Places client in a side-lying position to access the ventrogluteal site for IM injection. Withdraws medication from a glass ampule using a 20-gauge injection needle. Parenteral medications are administered via injection into body tissues using aseptic technique e.g., intradermal, intramuscular, subcutaneous, IV. Intradermal. Administer injections at a 5 to 15 degree angle to reduce risk of injection into subcutaneous tissue, option 2. Apply firm pressure to the injection site to reduce bleeding. Massaging the site introduces medication into deeper tissues and should be avoided, option 3. Subcutaneous. Administer injections at 90 degrees if 2 in 5 centimeters of subcutaneous tissue can be grasped or at 45 degrees if only 1 in 2.5 centimeters can be grasped. Option 1. Intramuscular. Acceptable sites include the deltoid, vastus lateralis, and ventrogluteal. The ventrogluteal is preferred as fewer large blood vessels and nerves are present. 
position the client supine, prone, or side lying with the knee and hip flexed when administering ventrogluteal NG. A nurse is evaluating an acutely ill client with suspected meningitis. The nurse should take what action first? Check for Koenig's and Brodzinski's signs. Establish IV access. Place the client on droplet precautions. Prepare the client for lumbar puncture. The client with suspected bacterial meningitis should be placed on droplet precaution isolation until the causative agent has been identified and appropriate treatment is initiated. Meningococcal meningitis and hemophilus influenzae type B meningitis are highly transmissible to others, and the client must remain on droplet isolation until these can be ruled out. Precautions can usually be discontinued 24 hours after beginning antibiotic therapy. Viral meningitis and other types of bacterial meningitis, i.e., other than meningococcal meningitis, usually do not require droplet precautions. The nurse receives the change of shift report for assigned clients at 7 a.m. Which client should the nurse assess first? Client with change in level of consciousness who fell in the nursing home. Client with chronic headaches who is scheduled for an MRI at 9 a.m. Client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, and pulse oximeter reading of 90%. Client with heart failure and 3-plus pitting edema of the lower extremities. The nurse receives the change of shift report for assigned clients at 7 a.m. Which client should the nurse assess first? Change in level of consciousness is a high-priority problem as it can indicate a neurologic deficit that can be associated with a closed head injury. At the beginning of the shift the nurse must perform a basic neurologic assessment e.g. pupil size and response, level of consciousness, lock mentation, speech, hand grasps. This is done to obtain the baseline data against which subsequent assessments can be compared and to assess for indicators of increased intracranial pressure, e.g., change in lock Cushing's triad pupillary changes. Option 2. The client with chronic headaches is scheduled for an MRI in two hours. Preparation for the test is not urgent at this time. This client's assessment does not take priority. Option 3. A pulse oximeter reading of 89% minus 92% is adequate and is an expected finding in a client with COPD who often relies on the hypoxemic drive to breathe. This finding is non-urgent and this client's assessment does not take priority. Which of the following drug administrations should be reported as a practice error? Select all that apply. Cephalexin administered client has history of anaphylaxis from penicillin. Hydromorphone 2 mg administered client reports pruritus. Immunization for 3 month old administered in ventrogluteal site. Oral niacin nicotinic acid administered client has facial flushing. Warfarin administered client at 12 weeks gestation. Which of the following drug administrations should be reported as a practice error? Select all that apply. Warfarin, coumadin, is generally contraindicated in pregnancy. Warfarin is a teratogen and exposure during early pregnancy can result in fetal malformations. Warfarin embryopathy. It crosses the placenta, resulting in fetal anticoagulation. Dangerous fetal bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage, can occur.
As a result, a client on warfarin is taught to use effective contraception. Option 5. For children age less than 7 months, the site for immunizations is the anterolateral thigh, vastus lateralis. The gluteus medius muscle, muscle injected with a ventrogluteal injection, is developed through crawling and walking. The muscles are not developed enough at this age to be used as an acceptable site. Option 3. History of penicillin hypersensitivity should be determined prior to administration. Clients who are truly allergic to penicillins, e.g., anaphylaxis, have an increased risk of allergy to other beta-lactam antibiotics. The incidence of cross-reactivity is 1% to 4%. Option 1. Option 2. Pruritus, itching, is a known side effect of narcotic administration, particularly if the client is opioid-naive. It does not represent true allergy and is often treated with an antihistamine. Nausea is also quite common when opioid therapy is initiated, but clients quickly develop tolerance. Option 4. Niacin, nicotinic acid or B3, is used in large doses for lipid-lowering properties. In large doses, it may produce cutaneous vessel vasodilation. The resulting warm sensation within the first two hours after oral ingestion is uncomfortable but harmless. It may last for several hours. Effects usually subside as therapy continues. Educational objective, do not administer warfarin if the client is pregnant. Intramuscular injections are given in the vastus lateralis to children age less than 7 months. Penicillins and cephalosporins can have a cross-sensitivity response. Narcotic-induced pruritus is not a true allergy. The clinic nurse is reviewing telephone messages from four clients. Which client's call should the nurse return first? Client who has just taken albuterol and reports a heart rate of 108 per minute and a coarse tremor in both arms. Client who is prescribed azithromycin and reports frequent foul-smelling liquid stools and abdominal cramping. Client who is prescribed metformin and reports a blood glucose of 284 mg per deciliter, 15.76 mmol, L, and frequent urination. Client who takes amiodarone and reports a dry cough and increased dyspnea when walking around the house. The clinic nurse is reviewing telephone messages from four clients. Which client's call should the nurse return first? Client who has just taken albuterol and reports a heart rate of 108 per minute and a coarse tremor in both arms. Client who is prescribed azithromycin and reports frequent foul-smelling liquid stools and abdominal cramping. Client who is prescribed metformin and reports a blood glucose of 284 mg per deciliter, 15.76 mmol, L, and frequent urination. Client who takes amiodarone and reports a dry cough and increased dyspnea when walking around the house. Amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic medication used to treat life-threatening arrhythmias that cannot be controlled with other medications. Amiodarone therapy is used only if other treatments have failed, as it has many toxic, adverse effects that may be severe. Pulmonary toxicity is a life-threatening adverse effect of amiodarone, which is believed to cause direct cellular damage and activation of an immune response in the lungs. Clients who develop pulmonary toxicity may report respiratory symptoms such as dry cough, pleuritic chest pain, and dyspnea. Clients with clinical manifestations of pulmonary toxicity require immediate intervention to prevent fatal, irreversible lung damage. Option 4. Option 1. Albuterol is a beta-2 agonist used to treat bronchospasm that commonly causes tachycardia and tremor. Clients reporting these symptoms may require a dose adjustment or change in medication regimen. Option 2. Frequent liquid stools in a client receiving antibiotics, e.g., azithromycin, may indicate development of Clostridium difficile infection, a serious gastrointestinal complication. However, possible pulmonary toxicity is the priority. Option 3. 
clients taking metformin, an oral antidiabetic, who report hyperglycemia and polyuria require follow-up to evaluate medication efficacy and glycemic control. Signs of pulmonary toxicity are more urgent, however. Educational objective, amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic medication used to treat life-threatening arrhythmias. Pulmonary toxicity is a life-threatening complication that may cause symptoms such as dry cough, pleuritic chest pain, and dyspnea. Clients taking amiodarone with signs of pulmonary toxicity require immediate follow-up. An unaccompanied 16-year-old girl comes to the emergency department with severe abdominal pain and vomiting. The client has a temperature of 102.2 F39C and a pulse of 120 per minute and is lethargic. The client's parents are out of town, and no guardians can be reached. How should this client's care be handled? Administer care until the parents or guardians can be reached. Admit the client but without giving care until the parents or guardians can be reached. Perform a pregnancy test to see if the client qualifies as an emancipated minor. Provide health care and follow-up advice but do not give any direct care. An unaccompanied 16-year-old girl comes to the emergency department with severe abdominal pain and vomiting. The client has a temperature of 102.2 F39C and a pulse of 120 per minute and is lethargic. The client's parents are out of town, and no guardians can be reached. How should this client's care be handled? Exceptions to informed consent by parent guardian in minors. Emergency care. 1. Condition in which delay of treatment is life-threatening. Emancipated minor. Adolescence. 1. Parent. 2. Married. 3. Military service. 4. Financially independent. 5. High school graduate. 6. Ho homeless. Specific medical care. Adolescence. 1. Sexually transmitted infection. 2. Substance abuse. Most states 3. Pregnancy care. Most states 4. Contraception. An unaccompanied minor should be treated if the medical condition is an emergency and should be assessed and stabilized. This client clearly has a medical need and could suffer consequences if not treated. In this scenario, care should be rendered and then explained later to the parent or guardian. This approach is supported by the ethical principles of beneficence and non maleficence. In addition, underage clients may consent in certain circumstances without parental consent. These circumstances usually include treatment for substance abuse problems, psychiatric disorders, or sexual transmitted diseases. Option 2. This client has signs, symptoms of systemic infection and possible dehydration or sepsis, an emergent condition. It is unknown when the parents or guardians can be reached. It would be negligent to not further assess and treat a potentially worsening condition. It is assumed that the parents or guardians would want safe, quality care for the client. Option 3. Qualifications for the status of emancipated minor are subject to state legislation but usually include individuals age less than 18 who are parents or pregnant, married, living as financially independent, or in the military. This client needs care that should be rendered regardless of status. Option 4. Providing follow-up advice will not stabilize a potentially serious medical condition. Care must be provided. Educational objective. An underage client whose parents or guardians cannot be contacted and who needs emergency care should receive all necessary medical care until a parent or guardian can be reached to provide consent. The nurse is planning care for a newborn client at term gestation who is large for gestational age. Which of the following are appropriate interventions to include in the plan of care? Select all that apply. Assess newborn for birth-related injuries. Discuss the need for feeding supplementation if symptoms of hypoglycemia occur. Encourage the mother to breastfeed the newborn every two to three hours. 
Notify the healthcare provider if capillary blood glucose is less than 45 mg per deciliter 2.5 mmol L. Perform capillary blood glucose checks prior to feedings. The nurse is planning care for a newborn client at term gestation who is large for gestational age. Which of the following are appropriate interventions to include in the plan of care? Select all that apply. NCLE exchanges of 2017 Please note that select all that apply say to questions on NCLEX can now include any number of correct responses. Newborns who are large for gestational age LGA, are diagnosed after birth by plotting their birth weight and gestational age on a growth chart. Weight must be at least greater than 90th percentile and is commonly greater than 8 pounds 13 ounces 4,000 grams. Risk factors include gestational diabetes, excessive gestational weight gain or elevated pre-pregnancy BMI, history of a prior newborn who is LGA post-term gestation, and genetics e.g., male sex, maternal birth weight, ethnicity. The nurse should prioritize assessment of birth injuries and hypoglycemia. When developing the plan of care for a newborn who is LGA, the nurse should include the following interventions. Document gestational age assessment, weight, length, and head circumference to identify newborns who are LGA. Assess the newborn for birth-related injuries, e.g., cephalohemata, clavicular fracture, lacerations, and review the birth record to determine if an operative vaginal birth occurred, e.g., forceps, option 1. Discuss the need for possible feeding supplementation, e.g., breast milk, formula, if the newborn is hypoglycemic, option 2. Assist the mother to feed the newborn soon after birth and every two to three hours thereafter to prevent hypoglycemia. Option 3. Obtain a capillary blood glucose BG before feeding to assess for hypoglycemia. And notify the healthcare provider when a capillary BG reading is less than 40 to 45 mg per deciliter 2.2 to 2.5 mmol L. Options 4 and 5. Educational objective, newborns who are large for gestational age have a birth weight that is greater than 90th percentile. The nurse should create a plan of care for the newborn that prioritizes assessment of birth injuries and hypoglycemia in addition to routine newborn care. The nurse prepares to draw up regular and NPH insulins into one syringe. Place in order the steps the nurse should take when mixing the insulins. All options must be used. Unordered options. Clean the vial tops with alcohol swabs. Draw up the NPH insulin solution. Draw up the regular insulin solution. Inject air into the NPH insulin vial. Inject air into the regular insulin vial.
mixing insulins allows multiple insulin preparations to be delivered in a single subcutaneous injection, thereby sparing the client from multiple injections. Intermediate-acting insulins e.g., NPH, can be mixed with short-acting e.g., regular or rapid-acting e.g., aspirate, lispro, insulins. Most long-acting insulins, e.g., glargine, detamir, are not suitable for mixing and are typically packaged in pre-filled syringes. When drawing up multiple insulins, there is a risk for contaminating the shorter-acting vials with the longer-acting insulin, which would slow the action of later doses withdrawn from the shorter-acting insulin vial. Multidose vials of regular insulin that have been contaminated with other insulins are unsafe for IV administration. When drawing up multiple insulins, the nurse should clean both vial tops with alcohol swabs. Option 1. Inject air into the NPH insulin vial without touching the needle to the solution. Option 4. Withdraw the needle from the NPH insulin vial and inject air into the regular insulin vial. Option 5. Invert the regular vial and withdraw the regular solution into the syringe. Option 3. Insert the needle into the NPH insulin vial and withdraw the solution. Option 2. During a routine assessment of a developmentally normal 18-month-old, the parent expresses concern about the small amount of food the child consumes. What is the nurse's priority intervention? Check the child for parasitic infections. Consult a pediatric nutritionist for suspected eating disorder. Educate the parent about physiologic anorexia. Notify the primary health care provider. Physiologic anorexia occurs when the very high metabolic demands of infancy slow down to keep pace with the moderate growth of toddlerhood. During this phase, toddlers are increasingly picky about their food choices and schedules. Although to the parents it may appear that the child is not consuming enough calories, intake over several days actually meets nutritional and energy needs. Parents should be educated concerning what constitutes a healthy diet for toddlers and which foods they are more likely to consume. Some strategies for dealing with a toddler during a stage of physiologic anorexia and pickiness include Set and enforce a schedule for all meals and snacks Offer the child two or three choices of food items Do not force the child to eat Keep food portions small Expose the child repeatedly to new foods on several separate occasions Avoid TV and games during meals or snacks The nurse assessing a client notices pearly white plaque-like lesions on the mouth mucosa. The nurse understands that which client is at highest risk for oral candidiasis. A client with asthma who uses an albuterol nebulizer once a day. A septic client receiving intravenous broad-spectrum antibiotics daily. A teenage client with braces who drinks several sugary drinks daily. An elderly client with poor oral hygiene and inadequate nutrition. Oropharyngeal candidiasis, or thrush maniliasis, is an infection of the mucous membranes generally caused by the yeast-like fungus Candida albicans. The fungus causes pearly, milk-curd, lesions on the oral or laryngeal mucosa that may bleed when removed. Immunosuppressed individuals such as those taking corticosteroid medications, clients undergoing chemotherapy or radiation, or clients with immune deficiency states, e.g., AIDS, have an increased incidence. Clients receiving prolonged or high-dose antibiotic treatment are at increased risk as the normal microbial flora of the mouth is reduced, allowing other opportunistic infections to arise. Option 2. Individuals with dentures and infants also commonly experience manilial infections. Treatment is antifungal medications, e.g., nistatin, and proper oral hygiene.
the nurse cares for a client diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus who came to the emergency department with the acute complication of diabetic ketoacidosis DKA. After checking the blood glucose, which prescription should the nurse implement first? Insert an indwelling urinary catheter for accurate output calculation. Obtain serum potassium level results and report to the primary healthcare provider. Prepare an insulin drip for intravenous IV infusion as prescribed. Start an IV line and infuse normal saline as prescribed. DKA is a life-threatening complication of type 1 diabetes characterized by hyperglycemia greater than 250 mg per deciliter that results in ketosis, a metabolic acidosis. Glucose cannot be taken out of the bloodstream and used for energy without insulin. The body begins to break down fat stores into ketones, as it does in a state of starvation, causing a metabolic acidosis, low pH and low HCO3. The lack of insulin also results in increased glucose production in the liver, worsening the hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia causes osmotic diuresis, and clients are severely dehydrated. The cardinal signs of dehydration are poor skin, turgid, dry mucosal membranes, tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension, weakness, and lethargy. Despite laboratory values showing hyperkalemia on admission, clients with DKA have a net potassium deficiency and will need careful replacement after fluid resuscitation. The nurse is providing discharge teaching for a client who suffered full thickness burns. Which statement by the client demonstrates a need for further instruction on the rehabilitation phase of a burn injury? I should avoid using lotion to prevent infection. I should perform range of motion exercises daily. I will avoid direct sun exposure for at least three months. I will wear pressure garments to minimize scars. The rehabilitation phase begins after the client's wounds have fully healed and lasts about 12 months. The initiation of this phase depends on the extent of the burns and the client's ability to care for themselves. Interventions in the rehabilitation phase are aimed at improving mobility and independence and minimizing the potential for long-term complications. These interventions include Counseling or other psychosocial support Gentle massage with water-based lotion to alleviate itching and minimize scarring Planning for reconstructive surgery Pressure garments to prevent hypertrophic scars and promote circulation Option 4. Range of motion exercises to prevent contractures Option 2. Sunscreen and protective clothing to prevent sunburns and hyperpigmentation Option 3. The nurse reviews an elderly client's medication administration record and identifies which prescriptions as having the potential for injury in the elderly. Select all that apply. Polypharmacy and physiologic changes associated with aging e.g., decreased renal and hepatic function, orthostatic hypotension, decreased visual acuity, balance and gait problems place the elderly at increased risk of adverse drug effects. The Beers criteria provide a list that classifies potentially harmful drugs to avoid or administer with caution in the elderly due to the high incidence of drug-induced toxicity, cognitive dysfunction, and falls. 
Some commonly used medications in this list include antipsychotics, anticholinergics, antihistamines, antihypertensives, benzodiazepines, diuretics, opioids, and sliding insulin scales. Amitriptyline Elevil is a tricyclic antidepressant used to treat depression and neuropathic pain. Its anticholinergic properties may cause dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, and dysrhythmias. Option 1. Chlorpheniramine chlorprimetin is a sedating histamine H1 antagonist used to treat allergy symptoms. Increased central nervous system effects, e.g., drowsiness, dizziness, may occur due to its reduced clearance in the elderly. Option 2. Lorazepam Ativan, is a benzodiazepine with a long half-life 10 to 17 hours. Side effects include drowsiness, dizziness, ataxia, and The emergency department nurse is assessing a client brought in after a car accident in which the client's head hit the steering column. Which assessment findings would indicate that the triage nurse should apply spinal immobilization? Select all that apply. Breath smells of alcohol. Client disoriented to place. Client report size burning. History of multiple sclerosis. Point tenderness over spine. The emergency department nurse is assessing a client brought in after a car accident in which the client's head hit the steering column. Which assessment findings would indicate that the triage nurse should apply spinal immobilization? Select all that apply. Spinal immobilization is not a benign procedure. An acronym to help determine the need for spinal immobilization is NSAIDs. N. Neurological examination. Focal deficits include numbness and decreased strength. S. Significant traumatic mechanism of injury. Alertness. The client may be disoriented or have an altered level of consciousness. Option 2. I. Intoxication. The client could have impaired decision-making ability or lack awareness of pain. Option 1. D. Distracting injury. Another significant injury could distract the client from spinal pain. S. Spinal examination. Point tenderness over the spine or neck pain on movement if there is no midline tenderness may be present. Option 5. Option 3. The sensation of burning eyes could be related to many issues and does not necessarily have a direct correlation to spinal trauma. Option 4. There is no direct correlation of multiple sclerosis, autoimmune progressive nerve demyelinization, with the need for spinal immobilization. Educational objective, indications for spinal immobilization include abnormal neurological findings, significant mechanism of injury, change in orientation or level of consciousness, intoxication, distracting injury, and point tenderness over the spine. Exhibit. The nurse is assessing a client who had an esophagogastroduodenoscopy three hours ago. The client is reporting increasing abdominal pain. Which clinical finding requires an immediate report to the healthcare provider? Click the exhibit button for additional information. Blood pressure 108 70 seconds of a millimeter Hg. Gag reflex has not returned. Sore throat when swallowing. Temperature 100.6 F 38.1 C. An esophagogastroduodenoscopy EGD, involves passing an endoscope down the esophagus to visualize the upper gastrointestinal structures, e.g., esophagus, stomach, duodenum. Perforation of the gastrointestinal tract is a life-threatening complication of EGD that can lead to peritonitis and sepsis. 
Signs of perforation include a sudden temperature spike, increasing pain, tenderness, restlessness, tachycardia, and tachypnea. The nurse should notify the healthcare provider immediately if the client develops a fever. Option 4. Option 1. Post-procedure changes in blood pressure can be caused by sedation, blood loss, or sepsis. Although the client had a slight decrease in blood pressure, it has remained relatively consistent with the other blood pressure readings and does not require immediate notification of the healthcare provider. Option 2. An EGD involves applying a topical anesthetic to the throat to pass the endoscope. It may take a few hours for the gag reflex to return. Absent gag reflex after a prolonged period, e.g., 6 hours, should be reported to the healthcare provider. Option 3. A sore throat is expected after certain procedures, e.g., EGD, intubation, due to local irritation. Warm saline gargles can provide some relief. The nurse is reinforcing teaching about ulcer prevention with a client newly diagnosed with peptic ulcer disease. Which of the following client statements indicate appropriate understanding of teaching? Select all that apply. I need to avoid taking medicines like ibuprofen without a prescription. I should avoid drinking excess coffee or cola. I should enroll in a smoking cessation program. I should reduce or eliminate my intake of alcoholic beverages. I will eliminate whole wheat foods, like breads and cereals, from my diet. The nurse is reinforcing teaching about ulcer prevention with a client newly diagnosed with peptic ulcer disease. Which of the following client statements indicate appropriate understanding of teaching? Select all that apply. Peptic ulcer disease PUD is characterized by ulceration of the protective layers, i.e., mucosa, of the esophagus, stomach, and or duodenum. Mucosal breaks allow digestive enzymes and stomach acid to digest underlying tissues, leading to potential gastrointestinal bleeding and perforation. Risk factors for PUT include gastrointestinal helicobacter pylori infections, genetic predisposition, chronic NSAID, e.g., aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, use, stress, and diet and lifestyle choices. Nurses educating clients with PUT about ulcer prevention should focus on modifiable risk factors. 1. NSAIDs Chronic use of NSAIDs can damage the gastric mucosa and delay ulcer healing. Option 1. 2. Caffeine, cola, tea, and coffee should be avoided as they stimulate stomach acid secretion. Option 2. 3. Smoking, tobacco increases secretion of stomach acid and delays ulcer, healing. Option 3. 4. Alcohol, alcohol should be avoided as it stimulates stomach acid secretion and impairs ulcer, healing. Option 4. 5. Meal timing, eating multiple small meals throughout the day or eating shortly before sleeping may actually worsen put by increasing stomach acid secretion. Option 5. Evidence does not support the standard elimination of specific foods from the diet in clients with PUD. However, clients should avoid foods that exacerbate their symptoms. Educational objective peptic ulcer disease PUD is a gastrointestinal illness caused by breaks in the gastrointestinal mucosa, leading to ulcer formation. To reduce ulcer formation risk clients with PUD should be instructed to stop smoking, avoid chronic NSAID use, avoid meals or snacks before sleeping, and limit alcohol and caffeine consumption. A nurse is instructing the caregiver of an 8-month-old client regarding administration of oral amoxicillin. The client is prescribed 25 mg per kilogram per day of amoxicillin in two divided doses for five days. The client weighs 16.5 pounds and the amoxicillin solution is prepared as 125 mg 5 milliliters. How many ml of amoxicillin should the nurse instruct the caregiver to administer for each dose? Record the answer using two decimal places. Answer the ML dose.
to calculate the milliliters per dose of oral amoxicillin, the nurse should first identify the prescribed dose, e.g. 25 mg per kilogram per day divided in two doses, and available medication, e.g. 125 mg 5 ml solution, and then convert to milliliters per dose, e.g. 3.75 ml dose. The nurse is teaching about cervical cancer prevention during a women's health conference. Which of the following factors should be taught as risks for cervical cancer? Select all that apply. Human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Human papillomavirus, HPV. Multiple sexual partners. Nulliparity. Sexual activity before a jateen. The nurse is teaching about cervical cancer prevention during a women's health conference. Which of the following factors should be taught as risks for cervical cancer? Select all that apply. Risk factors for cervical cancer. 1. Infection with high-risk HPV strains, e.g., 16, 18, 2. History of sexually transmitted infections. 3. Early onset of sexual activity. 4. Multiple or high-risk sexual partners. 5. Immunosuppression. 6. Oral contraceptive pill use. 7. Low socioeconomic status. 8. Tobacco use. HPV equals human papillomavirus. Almost all cases of cervical cancer result from persistent infection due to human papillomavirus, HPV, a primary risk factor. Option 2. HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection but is usually transient and resolves spontaneously. However, persistent HPV infection can cause abnormal changes in cervical epithelial tissue that slowly progress to invasive cancer if not treated. Most other risk factors for cervical cancer are related to behaviors that increase the client's risk of contracting HPV or an inability to clear the infection. Clients who have multiple sexual partners or initiate sexual activity at an early age less than 18 increase their risk for exposure to HPV, options 3 and 5. Clients with weakened immunity, e.g., HIV, immunosuppressive therapy, may have an impaired ability to clear HPV, which increases the risk for cervical cancer due to persistent infection, option 1. Option 4. Nulliparity, i.e., no previous pregnancies, is not a risk factor for cervical cancer, however, it is a risk factor for breast cancer. Educational Objective Human papillomavirus is the most common sexually transmitted infection and is a primary risk factor for cervical cancer. Other cervical cancer risk factors include sexual activity at an early age, age less than 18, multiple sexual partners, and weakened immune system function, e.g., HIV infection.